Hi, I'm Diane Myers from Texas Women's University, and today we'll be talking about PBIS in the classroom, correction. Let's start with a quick review. I'm hoping you remember the three-term contingency from our Behavior Basics module. An antecedent is a stimulus that precedes a behavior. Sometimes we say that the antecedent triggers a behavior. A behavior is an observable and measurable act. Remember, a behavior must be seen, and we must be able to describe what it looks like. Being disrespectful is not a behavior. Being out of seat is a behavior. A consequence is any stimulus presented contingently on a particular behavior. The consequence happens as a result of the behavior, and the consequence will increase the likelihood of the behavior in the future or decrease the likelihood of a behavior in the future. Where in this contingency does correction happen? If you said that correction is a consequence, you're right. If we use correction appropriately, we can increase the likelihood of behaviors that we want to see and decrease the likelihood of behaviors that we don't want to see. Let's think about two different scenarios that happen in the classroom. Here's the first one. During class, a student makes a loud and off-topic comment. For example, it's a good day for getting rowdy or who else stayed up all night playing Xbox? What is a standard teacher response in this situation? A lot of teachers would issue a no stop don't statement, sometimes angrily. You might hear a teacher say something like, don't make comments like that in my classroom, or stop talking out. Now let's look at the second scenario. A student mispronounces a word while reading along. For example, the student says seven when the word is severe. What is a standard teacher response to this situation? It's a different response than in the first scenario. A teacher wouldn't say, don't pronounce the word that way, or stop mispronouncing words. A teacher would probably point out the error, have the student try again, perhaps model the word for the student and have the student read the word back. The teacher would provide help, and when the student did pronounce the word correctly, the teacher would say, yes, that's correct. The teacher acknowledges that the student has been able to perform the academic behavior correctly. A very different response in the second scenario than in the first, but I want to challenge you to think about handling both scenarios the same way. That is, when a student makes a low-level behavior error, like in the first scenario, rather than no stop don't, we approach that error by pointing out the error, reteaching the desired behavior, and then providing acknowledgement when the student is able to engage in the appropriate behavior. We'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like down the road. First, let's talk about some of the assumptions that we need to avoid. We can't assume that all students know how they should behave in school. Not all students have had adequate practice, not all students have had adequate role models, and many students are coming to school without the social readiness skills to meet teachers' expectations. We can't assume that all students have had adequate practice with appropriate behavior. Students don't always learn academic skills the first time, and we don't penalize them for that. We can't assume that all students are going to learn behavioral skills the first time. Just like with academics, students might need more intensive instruction, they might need review, they might need to try some different ways of learning the content. We need to make sure that we are addressing students' learning differences in behavior just as we do with academics. We can't assume that all students are being reinforced for appropriate behavior rather than inappropriate behavior. If students like attention, they might find that it's much easier to get attention for behaving inappropriately, especially from their peers and teachers, than it is to gain attention for behaving appropriately. We can't assume that all behavior errors are deliberate. Sometimes students have disabilities or conditions that inhibit their ability to behave appropriately. Sometimes there are cultural differences that can appear as problem behavior in the classroom. Students may simply not understand the expectations in the classroom because they're different from the expectations in that student's culture. We can't assume that students will learn how to behave appropriately through negative consequences. Punishment doesn't teach how to behave appropriately. When addressing problem behavior in the classroom, first, teachers need to decide whether or not they should intervene to change problem behavior. Teachers should only intervene if a behavior interferes with the personal freedom or learning of that student or of other students in the classroom. Then, teachers need to consider the function of the problem behavior. Remember, from our Behavior Basics module, that there are only two functions of a behavior. Behavior functions either to get something or to avoid something. Let's look at some of the different reasons that students might be engaging in problem behavior in a classroom. Students may be trying to gain teacher attention. 
or they may be trying to gain peer attention. Students may be trying to avoid work or a particular peer or a particular teacher in the classroom. Students might be trying to gather information. They may be interested in seeing just how much problem behavior a teacher will tolerate before issuing a consequence, and they might be gathering information about if teachers will actually follow through on consequences. Some students might be engaging in problem behavior just to make a boring class more interesting. Hopefully, some of the strategies that we discussed in our interaction module will help keep our students engaged in actively learning during our classes. Let's look at a non-example of function-based response. We call this the coercive cycle. Let's say that a teacher gives a demand. Okay, class, we're going to start on our math work. And let's say that a student in this class finds that demand aversive. Perhaps the student doesn't like math, so the student engages in problem behavior. I don't want to do math. And then the student rips up his paper and throws it on the floor. This kind of problem behavior is aversive for the teacher who does not need a student acting out and causing problems in the class. So in response to the student's problem behavior, the teacher says, you know what? I don't think you're ready to learn. Why don't you go down to the principal's office until you're ready to learn? By the teacher doing that, the student escapes the aversiveness of doing math and stops engaging in the problem behavior. And now that the student is no longer engaging in the problem behavior, the teacher has escaped the aversive as well. Seems ideal. Everybody gets out of something that they don't like. However, if this cycle continues, the next time the student doesn't want to do something in the classroom, the student is likely to engage in that behavior. And the next time that a student engages in a behavior the teacher doesn't like, the teacher is likely to remove that student from the classroom. Who's in control here? Well, it's certainly not the teacher, okay? We wanna avoid the coercive cycle in the classroom by thinking functionally about how we approach problem behaviors. When intervening with problem behavior, we first need to clarify what inappropriate behavior actually is. First, we define our appropriate behaviors, which we've already done in our classroom matrix. If we've defined our appropriate behaviors well, inappropriate behavior is defined by default. We do still need to identify and categorize our inappropriate behaviors. We need to be able to have predictable consequences so that our students will know those consequences and so that staff will know those consequences. We do not want teachers making decisions about which consequences to issue when they are actively engaged in managing behavior. Those consequences should be established ahead of time so that we're not making decisions based on emotion when we're engaging with a student who's having a problem behavior. We need to establish a continuum of responses for classroom managed behaviors. Please refer to the continuum of responses for classroom managed behaviors for specific strategies. We'll be talking about that momentarily. Behaviors that are office managed rather than classroom managed are determined by the AISD student code of conduct in your campus discipline system. Here's the response continuum for classroom managed behaviors. First, we have pre-correction strategies to try and decrease the likelihood of problem behavior. These include prompting, proximity control, and active supervision. Then we move on to low-level behavior error strategies, which include error correction and practice with expected behavior. Finally, we have strategies for repeated behavior errors that include behavioral contracting, restitution and restoration, and a reflective assignment. Let's talk about the pre-correction strategies. Pre-correction strategies happen before problem behavior occurs. Pre-correction strategies are designed to decrease the likelihood of a problem behavior from happening. First, we create a positive environment in our classroom. We can do this by greeting students at the door, saying hello, good morning, good afternoon, using students' names when they enter our classrooms. We should be actively scanning the classroom, looking at students, listening to students, moving around the classroom, looking for opportunities to reinforce appropriate behaviors and remind students of our expectations. We should make our expectations clear and use language that reflects our expectations. Tell students when they're being respectful, responsible, and ready to learn. We should always reinforce behavior that meets our ex expectations. We need to pay a lot of attention to the behaviors that we want to see in order to increase the likelihood of those behaviors happening again in the future. 
We want to increase opportunities for active participation. Students who are actively engaged in instruction have little time to engage in problem behavior. We need to remove distractions from the classroom to the best of our ability. We should use proximity control, perhaps moving closer to students who are more likely to engage in inappropriate behaviors. We want to proactively prompt desired behavior. If students are prone to behavior errors during transitions, before a transition we want to remind students of what appropriate transitions look like. Maybe have them role play a few of those appropriate behaviors just so they're thinking about them when they actually begin to transition. We should increase wait time for student responses. If students don't have enough wait time, if we don't exhibit patience when they're waiting on them to engage in appropriate behavior, they might become frustrated and engage in inappropriate behavior. We should always model the behaviors that we want to see from our students. Sometimes I go into classrooms and I hear teachers saying, stop yelling at the top of their lungs. That's not modeling an appropriate behavior. We should always be a good behavior model for our students. Now let's look at some of the low-level behavior error correction strategies. An initial response to a low-level behavior error should be specific and contingent error correction. First, we identify the problem behavior. Then, we identify the expected behavior using expectation language. We reteach the skill if necessary. We provide descriptive feedback. We provide opportunities for the student to practice the expected behavior and we reinforce as soon as the appropriate behavior is displayed. Specific and contingent error correction for behavior errors looks just like error correction for academic errors. If problem behaviors persist, we increase the level of support. When students make academic errors more than once, we don't get angry, we try to find ways to help them be successful learners. If students make behavior errors more than once, we should increase the support and try to find ways to make them successful at behaving appropriately in the classroom. We need to think about students learning behavior like we think about students learning academics and we need to provide the same kind of support. Here's an example of what responding to low-level behavior errors can look like with this specific error correction. Here's the problem behavior. A student is off task during a lesson. He's looking out of the window, tapping his pencil, and not completing work. The teacher identifies the expected behavior using expectation language. Remember, being responsible during instruction looks like eyes on work or teacher, taking notes, and keeping hands and feet still. The teacher reteaches the skill if necessary. Let's all practice being on task. Class, show me what being on task looks like. The teacher provides descriptive feedback. Jimmy, that's exactly what being on task during instruction looks like. Nice job being responsible. The teacher provides opportunities for the student to practice the expected behavior. Class, throughout the day, I want you to remember to stay on task. The teacher reinforces as soon as she sees the appropriate behavior, just like the teacher would with an academic behavior. Class, great job being on task. You're all showing responsibility as learners. If problem behaviors persist, the teacher increases the level of support. Jimmy, try again. Meet with Jimmy after class to identify possible setting events, explore suggestions like moving seats, and so forth. The teacher can reteach and role play the skill until Jimmy develops fluency with that behavior. Here are some considerations when responding to low level behaviors. Try to deliver error corrections discreetly whenever possible. Make sure that students have plenty of opportunities to practice the desired behavior. Remember, students don't learn academic skills the first time. They may need additional practice with behavior skills, just like they do with academic skills. Try to have a private conversation or conference with the student. Maybe you can identify a setting event that's increasing the likelihood of an inappropriate behavior. Consider checking in with the parents or guardians if your initial error correction isn't successful. Remember that academic errors aren't always fixed after the first correction. Content might need to be retaught or approached in a different way to ensure student understanding. Behavior errors aren't always fixed after the first correction, so we might need to increase our level of support. We need to make sure we reinforce the appropriate behavior as soon as it occurs. When students correct an academic error, we acknowledge that. We should always acknowledge when students correct behavior errors as well. We give plenty of attention to behavior that doesn't meet our expectations, so we need to give attention to behavior that meets our expectations too.
finally, let's look at strategies for repeated behavior errors. One strategy for repeated behavior errors is behavior contracting. We talked about behavior contracts during our reinforcement module. You can also use them if you have repeated behavior errors. The behavior contract should focus on an appropriate replacement behavior that serves the same function as the inappropriate behavior. Restoration and restitution are other strategies that we can use for repeated behavior errors. In restitution and restoration, students who have disturbed the environment return the environment to its original condition and then some. For example, Michael knocks over a chair. In restitution and restoration, Michael would pick up that chair and then straighten up all of the other chairs in the classroom. You might want to consider having students write a reflective assignment for repeated behavior error. For a reflective assignment, a student would complete an assignment based on a problem-solving methodology. The student would identify what happened, the student would identify which behaviors did not meet expectations and why those behaviors didn't meet expectations, the student identifies the behaviors that were expected, and identifies what will be done differently next time. When responding to problem behaviors, teachers should consider the following. Corrective strategies cannot be used in isolation. Teachers must also teach and reinforce the appropriate behaviors that we expect from our students. Remember, punishment alone teaches nothing. We should not correct a behavior unless we are also teaching and reinforcing an appropriate behavior. We cannot assume that traditional punishment like detention and suspension will reduce problem behaviors. If that was the case, students wouldn't get repeated detentions or suspensions. Frequent use of punishment can lead to a hostile learning environment. Students are very unlikely to learn effectively in a hostile learning environment. Teachers should make sure that guardians are aware of the strategies for responding to problem behavior before you have to use them in your classroom. Teachers need to be objective and use observable, measurable language when stating which behaviors will result in consequences. By using observable and measurable language and having predictable consequences determined ahead of time, this will reduce bias and reduce inconsistency in discipline. Teachers should consider developing a chart to help them respond consistently to problem behaviors, and this chart could help others who come into the classroom, like substitute teachers, paraprofessionals, or volunteers, understand how to respond to inappropriate behaviors. Here's an example of what a chart like that could look like. First, you would determine if the behavior is office or classroom managed. Then you would determine the kind of error that you're seeing. If it's a low-level error, think about if you should reteach it, the specific strategies that you should use. If you're administering a consequence for repeated behavior error, think about how that consequence will be implemented and what that implementation will look like in the classroom. Finally, remember to spend most of your time preventing problem behavior from occurring. Think about prompting for the behaviors that you want to see, reminding students of the expectations, and always reinforcing the behaviors that you want to see in the classroom. Think about what you can do to decrease the likelihood of inappropriate behaviors. Be predictable and consistent in the way that you handle inappropriate behaviors. Always, always look for opportunities to reinforce behaviors that meet your expectations, and always think about the function of the problem behavior. What is a student trying to get or get away from with his or her inappropriate behavior? If you need more information, please refer to the Student Services Intranet website or consult with members of your campus PBIS team. Thank you.